بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى عليه وصحبه وسلم أما بعد هبت في الله continue on in our study of شر السنة للإمام المزني رحمة الله عليه رحمة واسعة we reach the towards the end of the treaties uh, where Imam Muzni, after talking about the about leadership and that from the Ittiqad or creed of Ahl Sunnati with Jama'a is not to rebel against the Muslim leaders and that making Hajj were in the Jumwa and Jihad fi sabilillah behind the Muslim ruler is Mishroor. This is something which is an obligation upon the Muslims and it is a legislated act by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in accordance with the sunnah of his prophet, his last prophet and messenger, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So after that, Imam al-Muzni rahmatullahi alayhi rahmatin wasi'a, he moved on in his treaties and he said, Qasr al-Salat wal ikhtiyar bain al-Siyam wal iftar fil asfar. So Imam al-Muzni rahmatullahi alayhi rahmatin wasi'a, he said, in this portion of the treaties, and he said, and shortening the prayer during travels and having the choice between fasting and breaking one's fast during travels, if one wishes. If one wishes, he may fast, and if he wishes, he may break his fast. So Imam Muslim's uh, speech is very clear, and it's very important for us to stop here and contemplate why would this possibly in a, be in a book of Aqidah? Why would Imam Muzni, and why does so many A'imma, A'imma to Deen, the Imams of the Sunnah in the past, why did they talk about issues like this? These are issues of Mu'amalat, issues of Fiqh and Ibadat, Fiqh al-Ibadat. These are issues of Fiqh al-Ibadat, you know, issues of uh, relating to jurisprudence, and the worship, uh, you know, how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which don't seem like they're in accordance with a book that is predominantly on creed. What is the relationship there? The relationship of Habitifillah, as Shaykh Ali Shubul mentions, half of the Allah ta'ala, he says, Have he min masail. So he said, these are from the fiqh issues, the issues that deal with jurisprudence, which enter into aqidah. They enter into creed. And he said, and it's from two different ways that this happens. He said, number one, lirad, and actually he mentions more than uh, two ways. But he says, number one, first, لِرَدْ بَعْدَ أَهْلِ الْبِدَعِي لِقَسَرَ الصَّلَاةِ السَّفَرِ وَجَمْعِهَا So the reason, the first reason why this enters, why the Imams of the Sunnah, like Imam Abu Bahari and so many other A'imma, why they entered some of these Masail Fiqiyah in their books of Creed, he said, first, it is a refutation of some of the people of Bid'ah. You know, some of the people of desire, some of the people from Ahla Ahwa, some of the people, some of the innovators. Regarding uh, shortening the prayer and combining it. Okay, so it's a rud on them. And then he's going to tell us, give us some more details. So he says, the second reason, he says, nas min yahram al qasr fi safar ma annahu qad ja'at bihi sharia. O yahram al jam bayna salatain wa ka ja'at bihi as sunna la kama qad tantaha lahu ba'd at tawaif wal bid'a uh he mentions then he said uh the second issue here it's because some people make it impermissible to shorten the prayer during travel uh, and this is come in the Sharia. It's come from the Nasus. It's come from the Book of Allah. It's come from the Sunnah of the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasalam. Or, meaning that there's another group 
or some from amongst them, they make it impermissible to combine to combine the two prayers. Or to combine between two prayers, meaning Dhuhr and Asr, for example, or uh, uh, Maghrib and Isha. And he says, however, in this regard, it is come in the Sunnah of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, regardless of what some of the uh, groups and the sects from Ahl al-Bid'ah uh, claim. And then he mentions the third point here. He said, لِتَوَاتِرْ الْأَدِلَّةِ مِنَ السُنَّةِ عَلَى شَعِيرَةِ الْجَمْعِ وَالْقَصَرِ فِي سَفَرِ الْمُبَاحِ وَالْمَشْرُوعِ He says, uh, He said, and do, uh, the, the third point here is due to the ample or the plethoral, plethora amount of evidence which illustrates from the Sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam that this is a sign uh, that one of the signs, the signs of what? The signs of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, the signs of the Deen that uh, combining and shortening the prayer during travel is something that is mubah, is something that's permissible, and it's mashroor, that it's legislated. Okay, so this is very, very uh, important uh, points that the Sheikh is mentioning here. And then he says, and shortening the prayer during travel, rahasahu Allah ila khalqi. So, shortening, <coughs> shortening the prayer during travel is something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rukhsa. It fr it's from those things uh, that he is given as like a relief or a uh, that he has made permissible uh, for his creation. Okay, that to, in order to take the mushakka, the difficulty, for example, uh, when one is traveling, it may be difficult to find a masjid and they have so many uh, various activities that they may have to do during their travels. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it easy for the traveler and for the one in jihad fi sabilillah and the one who is doing other fulfilling their needs during travel that he has made it uh, permissible for them to combine and shorten their prayer as a as a matter of ease for the believers and Then the Sheikh mentions, he says, and if someone believes that shortening the prayer is not permissible or it is not legislated, he said, And and taqsuru min as-salat in khiftum and yaftinukum yaftinukum alladheena kafaru Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says so the shaykh mentions he said so if someone believes you know it's from their aqidah he said fa in attaqid so if they believe according to their ittiqad according to what they believe what they uh believe is a part of their aqidah to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if they believe that shortening the prayer during travel is not legislated, then this is bid'ah. This is innovation in the religion. So now you can see the relationship that Imam al muzni is establishing uh, and, and, and showing and illustrating for us and why this is in his book of Itiqad. And we see Shaykh Ali Shubul, Hafidullah Ta'ala, detailing this uh, relationship for us and giving us insight into this mas'ala, that this is a mas'ala diniya, mas'ala itiqadiya, as well as fiqiyya, that this is an issue that relates to fiqh, jurisprudence, and it's an issue that also relates to itiqad, creed. So now we have this, this insight, and I want you to take this jewel, 
take this fa'ida with you because this is something will give you understanding for a lot of the kutub of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, those, those classical texts of the Salaf al Salih, Ridwan Allahi alayhim, and why they have these Masail uh, Fiqiyah, some Masail like wiping over the Khufain and stuff like this. Why do you find this in Imam Babahari's book, uh, uh, Shar al Sunnah, and other books? Why do you find the Imam the, the, talking about this? Because Ahl al Bid'ai, Ahl al Bid'a, and Ahl al Ahwa. They differed with Ahl Sunnah in these Masail. And, and this is one of the ways, one of the many ways that some of those early sects deviated from orthodoxy. They deviated from the creed of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah in these Masail. And so it became a Sha'ir, it became a, a, a Shi'ar of, of uh, Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. It became a sign of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. Some of these mas uh, Masail, like wiping over the Khufain. Why do you find this? And let me give you uh, an example how even in this time you'll find. I remember when I used to live in Yemen and I used to pray in Sana'a in some of the Masajid of the Shia Zaydiya. Okay, I didn't really know, you know, all the Masajid. Sometimes it was Dhuhr. The Adhan, it's a huge masjid right there in the souk. Let me go pray. Okay? And some of the issues I found, because I used, I, you know, fresh out of America, I had Khufain. I used to wear the Khufain back then and things like this. And I remember the way they used to look at me. And then sometimes they would yell at me and kind of get upset with me. Because I would be wearing Khufs. All of them had their feet exposed in the masjid. No one wore socks. They all took off their socks. Okay? Because that is one of their signs, which is a sign of, uh, uh, you know, not taking your socks off, but it can become where it becomes a sign of their religion for them and their belief. And these, you know, were Zaydiya, so they were closer to the Sunnah of the Prophet, ﷺ, but they had some bid'ah. They had some bid'ah in the Adhan, they had some bid'ah in their Ittaqad, in their creed, uh, bid'ah regarding the Khulafa Rashidin, but they're Muslim. But for them, I was doing a big crime and they used to get upset with me and almost, not almost get physical, but they would yell at me, but they understood that my Arabic was limited and I was from a different country. So they would just kind of yell at me and I would just, all I could simply say to them, ma ta'ar of sunnah, ma ta'ar of sunnah, and I would yell at them back and, and it would be an uh, interesting uh, engagement. So this happened to me many times back then and it shows what? Why am I relating this to you? I'm relating this story to you to show the sign of Ahl Sunnah and that we find in the classical text that they found that this was a sign of Ahl Sunnah is that they wiped over the Khufain. They didn't just take their Khufain off if it was mishrur, it was legislated for them to wipe. They could wipe over their, their socks and pray in their socks. However, from Ahl Bid'ah, they some groups of Ahl Bid'ah don't accept that. And this is the whole reason why Imam al Muslim is mentioning these issues like the Qasr wa Jam, uh, the, the shortening of the prayer and combining it during travel. And he also mentioned about the uh, about fasting as well. But going to the ayah uh, that the Shaykh mentioned, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you go throughout the earth, then it is no harm upon you if you shorten. Your prayer, shorten from your prayer. And then he, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, especially if you are fearful that you will have fitna from those who disbelieve. So this is letting us know during the time of jihad and a time of other times where there's fitna, that this is showing that this is mishroor, that this is from the Quran to combine one's prayers. The, and there's so much to, to talk about that, but we want to talk about it from the Haytha Ittaqad, and that's why we're mentioning it and, uh, and detailing it from that point with regards to distinguishing Ahl Sunnah from Ahl Bid'ah, not going into all the Ahkam of, of Sefer. Uh, the other point that Imam, uh, Imam Muzani mentioned, so he, he said, Qasr uh, salat wal ikhtiyar bayna siyam wal iftar. As far. So that is very important. So here he says, shortening the prayer and the choice between fasting and breaking one's fast during travel. So the scholars, they also differ quite a bit and have aqwal about the 
uh, not about this being mashroor, that this being legislated, abedin. They This is legislated. But however, the point is some scholars, they take the view that the... Uh, with regards to the fasting person, if they're traveling, that they should take this ruksa, no matter what. If they're traveling, and it, even if it's a short distance, as long as it meets the criterion of travel, then the person should, they believe that it's afdal, that it's better to break uh, their fast. Okay? Another group of the ulama, and I believe this is the qawl al-rajihi, as many of the uh, Muhaqqiqeen, some of the ulama, they mention that, uh, that no, if there's some mushakka, if there's difficulty. So, for example, now we have airplanes, we have so many things. You have that option, but it's better to continue your fast and not have to make up your fast and not be around the people and you're not even fasting during the holy month of Ramadan uh, and all you did was travel for one hour on a plane and there was no difficulty, Okay or even if it's five hours, or whatever the case may be. The point being, so this group of ulama, and I hold this view, that, uh, you know, if there is a, 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 a great deal of mashakka, there's a great deal of difficulty. And one example is, I used to uh, not break my fast even, and I would travel to America from Saudi Arabia. And my flights at that were like 18 hours. Okay, and I would lose track of time. In that situation, it would have been better for me to have broken my fast because there was great difficulty on the plane, and you're going through different time zones even. So it was it, it became very confusing uh, regarding this mas'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So in a situation like that, uh, where there's a great difficulty and you're also un, you know not sure because you're entering different time zones and so on and so forth, then there is great mashakka in that and it would be better to break your fast. So this is the point, is that this is also a sign of Ahl Sunnah. Then Imam Muzni, rahmatullahi rahmatin wasiya, he mentions the consensus of the past Imams of guidance upon these statements. So then Imam Muzni, he begins to... Uh, to end his treaties and give a summary of the importance of the i'tiqad or creed of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah and that this is something which is has consensus from the Imams of the Sunnah. And he says, the early Imams of guidance from the past have a consensus upon these statements and deeds. And with guidance from Allah the Tabi'een, held on to them and took them as examples to be followed and were pleased with them. And they stayed far away from whatever exceeded these statements. So they remained upon the correct path with the help of Allah and were successful. They did not turn away from al ittiba such that they fell short. And they did not go beyond these statements such that they became extreme and exceeded the bounds. So we trust in Allah and rely upon Him, and we desire to reach Allah by following these Imam's narrations. Here Imam Musani is giving us so many benefits from even this very general statement, and is showing the path and the minhaj of Ahl Sunnati with Jama'ah. <coughs> and that the i'tiqad, the creed of Ahl Sunnah, is something which is agreed upon from the Imams of Ahl Sunnah. And more importantly, when we talk about the Imams of Ahl Sunnah, that means we're talking about the Sahaba to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Radiallahu Ta'ala Majma'in. And we are talking about the general precepts of the creed and i'tiqad and the minhaj of Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah. And the Prophet ﷺ said, The best people are those people of my generation, then those who follow them, then those who follow them. This is showing the fadl and the fadail of the Salaf al -Saleh. This is showing the superiority of the Salaf al And that the Ru'us Salaf, who are the heads of the Salaf? Sahaba to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, radiyallahu ta'anhum, ajma'in. And so, the Shaykh mentions that with regards to this, this shows the difference between Ahl Sunnah and Ahl al -Bid'ah. And that Ahl Sunnah is united upon these precepts that Imam al-Muzni has uh, given us some 
detail about, that these principles or these points of creed uh, have consensus from Ahlul Sunnah. And the Sheikh mentioned something benefit. He says, وَفِي هَذَا إِشَارَةً إِلَى الْأَصْلِ أَنَّ مُصَادَرَ تَلَقِّي الْعَقِيدَةِ هِيَ ثَلَاثَ الْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ وَالْإِجْمَاعِي فَمَصَادَرَ تَلَقِّي الْعَقِيدَةِ So then he, he begins to talk about it in detail. So he says that this right here, this statement that Imam Muzni mentioned, the, what we just read, that this is pointing out the, the foundation and the foundation of how Ahl Sunnah deduces their creed. How Ahl Sunnah gets their creed. Where does it come from? Is it something that they just made up from their desires and then they just went and ran around looking for text to authenticate and to uh, verify their actions? That is the tariqah to Ahl al-Bid'ah. So a difference between Ahl sunnah Ahl sunnah now listen to what the Sheikh says. This is how Ahl sunnah gets their creed. This is how we know when we talk about the creed of Ahl sunnah Tiwul Jama'ah. It's not something we just made up. And when people say Salafis have this view or the Salaf had this view or whoever had this view, we have to know where it came from. Where do those views come from? What is the views of the Salaf Asali? Where do they come from? Why do they differ from the Mu'attala? Why do they... <coughs> <clears throat> Why do they differ from the Jahmiyyah? Why do they differ from the Khawarij? Why do they differ from the Murjiyah? Why do they differ from the Qadariya? Why do they differ from the Mu'tazila? And all of these sects, Why? What, what's the difference? Where do they? all these sects get their creed from? So Ahl Sunnah, they get their creed from that the, the place of origin for their creed is three. The Book of Allah, the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Ijma'ah. And the consensus, that which is consensus. And this is why it's relevant to what Imam Muzani uh, said. So then the Shaykh, he begins to detail a little bit more. He says, Al-Kitab al-Aziz huwa Qur'an. Huwa Qur'an. He said the, the, the book of Allah, uh, the, the Qur'an is the first point. Which is the, the holy Qur'an. Al-Qur'an al-Kareem. And then... He mentioned was Sunnah to Sahihah. The second point, place is from the Sunnah, the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is where we get our creed from. This is why we differ with like the Ashiris and others because when we look at creed, and for example, we say, well, Allah said that uh, uh, that He uh, rolls above the throne, okay. And we say that in a manner that suits his majesty, not like his creation, because the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa al -basir. Nothing is like him, and he is the all-hearing and all-knowing. Ahl Sunnah says exactly that. That's what we say. So how can you fight Ahl Sunnah for that? And then Ahl Sunnah also says what our Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said in an authentic hadith. Qala Nabiya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam qal, يَنزَلُ رَبَّنَا تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى كُلُّ ثُلُثَ اللَّيْلَ الْآخِرِ فِيَقُولُ يَنزَلُ رَبَّنَا تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى إِلَى السَّمَاءِ الدُّنْيَا كُلُّ ثُلُثَ اللَّيْلَ الْآخِرِ فِيَقُولُ That the, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, Our Lord, He descends to the lowest heaven every last third of the night and then says in, in, to the Akhira Hadith, the point being, Habit of Allah, Ahl Sunnah from the Sahaba you know, the Salaf al-Saleh, they made taslim to these nasus. They said, khalas, our messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said this, we say that. And we believe that. And we don't ask how. So that means we take that authentic, it's an authentic hadith, khalas, we take that. Ahl al-Bid'ah will cause doubt about the hadith, and then they will make ta'wil about it. Then they will change the meaning, or they'll change the alfad, or they'll say that it means this, and it means that. And they go here and they go there instead of make a taslim linusus. That is a difference in minhaj. That is a difference uh, in methodology of how to understand the creed of Ahl Sunnah. And it's very important to understand that. It's very important to see the difference between Ahl Sunnah and those various groups. Why? What is the difference in the asl between us in the Ashadis and that? It's those issues of sifat. And then there's other issues because they have changed as a sect and they've adopted other practices. But initially, they were the closest to Ahl Sunnah. 
So a lot of the Imams of the Sunnah, they call them the closest to Ahl Sunnah, the Ashiris. Why do we have such problems with them? Because they, their Masdar al or how they uh, obtain their creed and why it deviates from the Salaf, from the Sahaba, we have a problem with because they differ with them and we're going with what they say. Sahaba to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam radiyallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in and that's the asl of the of the jama'ah and that's the asl of the ijma'ah so it's the asl of the jama'ah the main group uh, of, the main group ahl sunnati wal jama'ah they're the ru'us they're the heads of the salaf ru'us al salaf ru'us al jama'ah that's the sahaba radiyallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in and their understanding and that differs uh, and they're also the Asl and the origin of the uh, of the ijma of the consensus. That's what we we go to, especially when we're talking about creed. Now let's go detail. Let's go a little bit further. So then the sheikh he mentions that the third maratib, if you will, the third level of how Ahl Sunnah gets their creed is the ijma al mu'tabar. It is the it is the, uh, the, the, the consensus which is the most important consensus. The one that we look to. Limadha. Why? He says, وَهَذَا مَا نَصَّ عَلَيْهِ شَيْخَ الْإِسْلَامِ فِي الْوَاسَطِيَ لَمَا قَالْ الْأَصْلَ الْأَوَّلَ الْقُرْآنِ ثُمَّ قَالْ الْفَصْلَ وَالسُنَّةِ تُفَسِرَ الْقُرْآنِ وَتَبْيِينَهُ أو تُبَيِّنَهُ وَتَدِلَّ عَلَيْهِ وَتَعْتَبِرْ عَنْهُ ثُمَّ قَالَ الْأَصْلُ وَأَصْلُ الثَّالِثِ الْإِجْمَاعِ وَالْإِجْمَاعِ الَّذِي يَنْضَبِطُ مَا كَانَ عَلَيْهِ سَحَابَةُ وَتَابِعُونَ إِذْ بَعْدَهُمْ كَثِيرَ الْخِلَافِ will intashirat al-ummah walihadha sa'ar al-i'taqad al-salafi mujma' alayh this is very important ibarah and this is coming from uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and he's referring back to Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah in general I think this is not an exact quote but he's given in general what Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said in Wasatiyah so he's saying that the, the ijma, the consensus, that the one that's considered, that we should consider, that is authentic, the most important authentic consensus, is that which Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah mentions in his book, Aqidah al Wasatiyah, when he said that the first foundation is the Quran. And then he says, Thumma, then, so he's given us some tartib, then. The Sunnah. And the Sunnah explains and clarifies the Quran. And it also is uh, evidence for the Quran. You know, it illustrates the Quran. And it, if you will, articulates the Quran because you, you see how the the Quran is practiced through the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet. And then he said. Al Asla Thalith, so we mentioned the Quran, we mentioned the Sunnah, the third foundation that Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah mentions as Al Ijma is the consensus. And he says the Ijma, it is that which is that which is codified in accordance with what the Sahaba and the Tabi'un uh, believed and held. And after them, there were so many differences that spread and the Ummah spread out. The Ummah spread out and there were so many differences, meaning after the Tabi'in. And he said, and for this reason, that the Itiqad, the Salafi creed, is that which there's consensus about. Because he's referring back to what? The consensus of the Sahaba, radiyallahu ta'ala majma'in. So, Ahla Hadith, Ahla Athar, Ahla Sunniti wal Jama'ah, uh, the Salaf al-Salih, uh, and in contemporary times, 
Selefiun, their creed, their creed comes from the Salafasari. And it goes back to what the Sahaba رضي الله تنعنم اجمعين were upon. That is what we look to to understand those nasus of the Quran and the Sunnah. What they were united upon. And especially we're talking about creed. So that's very, very important for us to understand that and to to uh, practice that and, and and implement that because that is the i'tiqad of Ahl Sunnati with Jama'ah and that's how it is deduced. And that differs from many, uh, if not most, of Ahl al bidah in one form or another. Then Imam Muzni, Rahmatullah he ends his his treaties, he says, with the point about preserving the observance of the obligatory and super, uh, and the like the nawafil or the extra deeds and avoidance of the unlawful deeds. So he ends by talking about practice. So here he's giving you all this etiqad. His whole risala, his whole treatise was about the creed of Ahl Sunnati with Jama'ah from different aspects, different points of creed that was codified by the Imams of the Sunnah. And he ended by talking about the consensus and where that consensus comes from. And that is the consensus of the Sahaba رضي الله تنعين المجمين. And that is the la shak, the cons consensus that is ma'tabar, that is the one that is the most authentic and considered. And so then he ends by talking about the importance of practicing this knowledge. He says, so I have this explanation of the Sunnah in order to clarify and elucidate it. So whoever Allah grants success will carry out the, that which I have clarified, along with the assistance of Allah in performing the obligatory duties uh, and taking precautionary measures against the impurities, performing the purification properly in obedience, hajj for the people of diligence and ability, fasting a month for the people who have health, and five prayers that were prescribed by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After those prayers, there is the prayers of Al-Witr during every night, and the two units of Fajr, and the prayers of the Al-Fitr, and uh, the Eid prayers, and the prayers of the uh, solar and lunar eclipses when they occur, and the prayer for rain, Al-Istisqa, when it becomes obligatory. He said, and one must avoid the unlawful affairs and take caution against a namima, lying, backbiting, transgressing against others, and it is unlawful to speak about Allah without knowledge. All of these are major unlawful sins. So Imam Muzni, he's ending his treaties by talking about the importance of practicing and the importance of adhering to the fara'id, doing your wajibat, the obligatory duties. One of the points we want to mention here is, uh, you know, as Imam Muzani, he mentioned about uh, that Namima, you know, being one of the major sins, you know, backbiting and slant, uh, carrying tales and slandering people, that this is a very serious, a very tra serious transgression because the Prophet ﷺ let us know in a hadith that was related, uh, I believe it was by Ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, or I believe it was Ibn Abbas, and he said, مَرَّ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ عَلَىٰ قَبَرِينَ فَقَالْ إِنَّهُمْ لِيَعَدْبَانُ وَمَا يُعَدْبَانُ فِي كَبِيرٌ أَمَّا أَهَدَهُمَ فَكَانَ لَا يَسْتَتَرُمَ الْبُولُ وَأَمَّا الْآخِرُ فَكَانَ يَمْشِ بِي النَّمِيمَ The Prophet ﷺ said regarding the Mima, uh, in this hadith, it was related, he was walking by two graves, and there were, in another narration, it makes it clear that they were graves of uh, Jews that had passed on. And he said, And he pointed to them and he said, Verily they're being punished in the graves, and they're being punished for something which is not, that the people don't think is a big deal. And he says, As for one of them is they used to not cleanse themselves properly when they used the restroom. So it shows that it was a son of the people before, the Ahl Kitab before that they needed to clean themselves, uh, they had to make a stinja. So that is a, a sunnah that was with the other ummas as well, that was passed on of cleaning yourself, akramakum Allah, when you go to the restroom. And Amma Akhir, as the Prophet said, and as for the other one, as he used to do, carry tales with the intention to spread wickedness around the community. So this shows us that Namima is one of the major 
sins. Why? Because the Prophet said, they, Verily, they're being punished in the grave and they're being punished for something what the people don't think is great or is a big deal. Letting us know that that's one of the major sins because you don't get punished in the grave for something small, but rather, if it earns specifically that punishment and that torment, it lets us know it's one of the major sins. So the Sheikh mentions here that there are different ways to discern that the ulama of Sunnah used to differentiate between major sins and minor sins. And we'll go over that really quickly. He said one of the first ways is that one of the ways that you discern between the major and the minor sins is that the, what the Quran, uh, the Quran made this uh, distinction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitab al-kareem, In tajtanibu al-kaba'ir, Letting us know that what? There are kaba'ir, there are major sins. And then he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned some of the kaba'ir uh, in another ayat, Allah Tabarak wa ta'ala says, Alladheena yajtanibuna kaba'ir kaba'ir al-ithm wa fawahisha illa lamama. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that there's a, a difference here. He said, and those who avoid the major sins, those major sins like fawahish, like, you know, zina, adultery, and those other types of wicked sins. So this lets us know that there are kaba'ir wa sagha'ir. There are major sins and minor sins. And likewise, how we can discern some of those, uh, make this distinguishment, is the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam said in uh, a hadith about Ichtenibu, uh, ich, ichtenibu a kabair or ichtenibu a sabar mubiqat. The Prophet Ali Salatu Salam said in an authentic hadith, he said, avoid the seven deadly sins. Let's us know that what? And there's there's more than seven, but the Prophet Sallallahu distinguished seven here, letting us know that those are from the major sins. Okay, and he began with shirk billah. That shirk, committing polytheism, is, is one of the greatest sins you can do. It is the greatest sin you can do. Uh, you know, shirk, uh, associating a partner with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, or with Allah Tabarak Wa Ta'ala, or other, worshiping other than Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, that's the that's the biggest sins. The greatest thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us is to worship him and Allah alone. That's Tawheed. And the greatest thing or the most severe thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has warned us against is shirk, polytheism. Uh, how we can discern these things these, the, these, uh, the major from the minor sins, one of the ways that the ulama they mentioned is every sin that is mentioned with a punishment in uh, this life. For example, the hud of zina, zina, the hud, the, the, the punishment of zina, the punishment of, of, uh, of drinking alcohol, for example. So since they have a hud, we know that those are major sins. They wouldn't be a major sin if there wasn't a punishment attached to it, okay? That's one of the ways. Another way is that if there is a wa'id fil akhira bin nar, if there is a threat of punishment in the hereafter, that a person will be tormented in the hellfire. That's also a way to let us know that it's a major sin. Uh, a third way is if there is a wa'id, is there's the threat of a li'an or la'an, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentions that the person is cursed. And when you're cursed, that means fard min rahmatillah. That means a person is, if you curse someone, you make la'in on someone, that means you are asking that Allah, that they, you, you're making, asking that that person be removed from the mercy of Allah. That's severe. That is very severe. So it shows us the person who is cursed, that they are being uh, cursed that it is a way of them being uh, removed from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when the threat of wa'id, so when we have a nas, we have a text from the Quran or the Sunnah, which shows that there is the threat of, uh, of, of, of curse 
upon that person for this sin that lets us know that it's one of the major sins. Another way that we know that something is a major sin is if there is the the threat uh, the 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 threat of that this is something that makes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala angry. Ghadab min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses the, pe the person and that he is angry. His wrath is upon them. Then that lets us know that's one of the major sins. Another way that we know to distinguish the major from the minor sins is if it is something in which it is mentioned that iman has been, is negated for that person. For example, the one... Uh, For example, the Prophet ﷺ said in a, a hadith, authentic hadith, and this hadith is in uh, Sahih Bukhari. The Prophet ﷺ said, Wallahi la yu'min, Wallahi la yu'min, Wallahi la yu'min. Qalu, man ya Rasulullah, khaba wa khasar, o khusir. Qala, man la yu'min, man la yu'min, uh, jara, jara, biwa'iqa, biwa'iqahu. Thayyib. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and this shows us this next point on how we distinguish between a major and a minor sin. Uh, in this hadith, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, it shows that it, it negates iman for this person. Now, we have to understand when we have the threat of wa'id in these nasus here for major sins because the part of the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah, and we talked about it before, is that Ahl Sunnah believes that the major sins do not negate a person's Iman, meaning that they're, you don't make takfir of them. They are not disbelievers. If you do a major sin, you commit zina, you drink wine, whatever the case may be, you spread namima, that doesn't mean you're a disbeliever. It doesn't mean you're a, a disbeliever, but it means you've done a major sin which you're deserving of the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you could be forgiven from that, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you can make tawbah from that. So, uh, but there are nasus, there are texts from the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, which give the threat, the punishment, and these are called the nasus al-wa'id. These are called the texts which threaten for a major sin that the person doesn't believe. Or that Allah, that the Prophet alayhi salam, mentions that they, they have disbelieved. That doesn't mean, that means the, it means they... We know that kufr is of two types. Kufr al-akbar or kufr al-askar. There's the major kufr and there's the minor kufr. So there's a major disbelief and the minor disbelief. So these nusus al-wa'idiyya or nusus al-wa'id, they refer to the minor disbelief. They refer to the minor disbelief, but it's still described as disbelief because in this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, la yu'min. He said it three times. He said, well, he said, Wallahi, by Allah, they don't believe. Well, by Allah, he doesn't believe. By Allah, he doesn't believe. By Allah, he doesn't believe. The Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said that. And then the Sahaba, radiyallahu ta'ala, majma'in, they said, Who, ya mess oh, Messenger of Allah, because they wanted ilm. They wanted that which is going to benefit them. They wanted to stay away from the fire. They wanted to go to Jannah. So that's why they asked questions. That's why they wanted to know. They said, Who, O oh, Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, you know, that is deceive and, and, and that is, uh, that is, um, khasr or khusr. This, this person who, who is, uh, who's a loser. Who is this that has been deceived and that they're a loser? Because, you know, they disbelieve, disbelieved. The Prophet ﷺ responded, he said, the one who basically commits adultery with his neighbor's wife meaning the neighbor's wife is not safe from his adulterous move so the one showing us that that is a major sin committing adultery is a major sin that is enough right there of a major sin you know punishable offense but the one who does it with his neighbor's wife, because that means his neighbor's not safe. Even if she was a bad woman and he's a bad man, you know, they're both uh, committing a, a wicked, wicked sin. So that shows right there that that is one of the major sins. And the Prophet ﷺ described the one who commits this, whose wife is not safe from this predator, in a sense, 
uh, that this uh, person, uh, he doesn't believe. It doesn't mean he is a disbeliever, but it means that he is a, it doesn't mean he's a disbeliever from the, the major uh, disbelief that he's out of the fold of Islam, but he is a major sinner. He's done a major sin, which is the minor disbelief. I hope that's clear. And then the, the next point uh, the Sheikh mentioned to distinguish between the major and the minor sins, he said, those sins in which the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam mentioned, or the Nasus mentioned, that the that there is a tabriya minhu, tabara minhu, that there is uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that he is free from them. Then that is evidence that anyone the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned who does this action that mentions that means that that action is one of the major sins. So the Prophet ﷺ, for example, he said, "Man hamala alayna salah, falaysa minna." So the Prophet ﷺ, he removed himself, he freed himself. He said, "Whoever holds a weapon against us, who brings a weapon against us, whoever fights us, basically, he's not from us. Whoever fights the Muslims, he's not from us." So that means. That is a threat of a severe punishment. That means it's a major sin. It doesn't mean he's not from us. He's a disbeliever. No, it means that he has done, uh, the Prophet ﷺ is freed from him in the sense that he's done a major sin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And a last point the Shaykh mentioned is that this is, <coughs> that these dhuabit, that these criterion uh, you'll find from the Salaf, that the Salaf of this Ummah, the classical scholars, they use these uh, criteria to determine uh, whether something was a major or minor sin. Then Imam al-Mazidi, rahmatullahi rahmatin wasiyah, he ended his treaties by saying, an inquiry about earnings, food, spouses, drinks, and clothes, and avoiding desires since they lead to the commitment of unlawful acts. So whoever wavers around the unlawful is in danger of falling into it. So whoever finds it easy to avoid unlawful acts, then he is upon he is upon guidance from the religion, and he is upon hope from mercy. And may Allah grant us and you the success to follow his straight path through his internally abundant honor and his most generous and lofty glory. And may the peace and mercy and blessings of Allah be upon you and upon those who recite the greetings of peace upon us. And the greeting of peace is not presented to the misguided ones. And the praise is for Allah, Lord of the worlds. We've completed this treatise with the praise and blessing of Allah and may the abundant and plentiful peace and salutations of Allah be upon Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his family, his companions, and his chast wives. Allahumma ameen. Ahabat Allah, the Imam ended his treatise by uh, making dua, which is from the menhaj of the Salaf al-Salih, that they used to make dua in the beginnings of their treaties and also in the ends of their treaties uh, you know, for the 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 ones who re read their uh, treatises, you know, read their rasa'im, that this is from the menhaj and to opening the hearts of those people and showing that these are things of iman, that this is the study of iman and this is bringing us closer as ahli iman bi idnillah ta'ala and this is wanting good for one another and this is helping to open our hearts towards the Imams of the Sunnah and towards the information that they uh, have presented to us. And so we end this treatise and the study of this treatise and we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing us to live through this and have benefited, I hope, through the study of this great uh, treatise from Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. And may Allah bless us with tawfiq to study more and benefit one another. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with ikhlas, with the bat. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon Imam Muzani and shower his blessings upon him for uh, the great works and his uh, supporting and assisting uh, Ahli Iman and Islam and the Muslims. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.